There's a sandwich here on the stage. <laughs> I'll just leave it there. Uh, welcome back, everyone, to the second part of this Double Bill program, um, where now we're going to talk about love and algorithms. Very exciting that we can uh, continue the discussion with Rohan van Voorst. I will presume that you were uh, all there. Uh, but we will be joined as well by Jonas Lund, who will start this session with a short presentation about his own work. Um, of about 20 minutes, 25 minutes. And then we can have a discussion with the three of us. And of course, again, you are also invited to take part. Um, the session is again about an hour long, so we will close at uh, 2.30 p.m. Um, I don't think I need to uh, introduce Roanne anymore, but let me shortly introduce uh, Jonas to you. Uh, Jonas Lund is an artist, uh, he is known for his performative artworks, uh, which always discuss also di uh, digital technologies. And here he will present his new online uh, work, One on One Plus One. It was specially commissioned for the Impact Fe Festival. And, uh, well, he will show us and uh, talk to us about it. Um, as said, please uh, uh, think about your questions that you have, also for the online viewers. Um, I know that there is already one question on the iPad, so we can immediately get started. Um, we will be talking about possibilities and dangers of algorithmic matchmaking, about, again, the future of intimacy, uh, in short, love and algorithms. Jonas, please, the floor is yours. Hi. Uh, thanks for coming, and thanks so much for the introduction, and thanks to Impact for inviting me, and thanks to everybody. I prepared a, a brief presentation, I think we can switch to my laptop, yes, that has four different titles. It's a kind of a weird introduction, but uh, so the first title is Hello Capitalism, uh, the second title I want to know what love is, third title we watch ourselves watching, and the fourth title in a closed zero-sum game the computer always wins. Uh, maybe even the fifth title, I like to measure things. Uh, so uh, it's a brief presentation, I'm covering a couple of different works, all dealing with sort of a mix of algorithms. Maybe not as much focus on love, but I guess I can bake it in there. Uh, so this is the true statement, I like to measure things quite a lot. It's recently become very obvious to me that I like to measure things a lot. Like I have, most of the things I have at home involve some type of measurement like a scale or a thermometer gun or all these kind of things. So uh, in my work, as I explore different types of optimization strategies, algorithmic decision making, power structures, the measuring comes in handy. Because as part of this, all the kind of algorithmic decision making, as we shall see, involves a profound level of measuring things. Which is funny, I, I just have to say this side note. Last I was here at Impact uh, doing a presentation on this podium was 2013 when I talked about this work, the top 100 highest ranked curators in the world, which, it was, which is a result of me measuring a lot of art world data, compiling a curatorial ranking algorithm, and then turning it into this piece of uh, 100 images. And if you look really closely on position 15, and this is from data from 2013, is Impact's Modern Love curator, Katerina Gregos. It's uh, quite some forecasting, sort of predicting the future, I'd say. Uh, okay, so what is an algorithm? I believe most of us know, right? Because the algorithm has existed in our vernacular for the last 10 years, let's say. But I think if we're going to talk about love and algorithms, it makes sense to just establish the baseline, right? So, defined as a set of rules or instructions to be performed. 
it's uh, input rules output plus the governed by the objective or the goal of the algorithm. I think I had a brief conversation last week with a, a programmer, not in the cultural field, who distilled that everything in programming, everything in automatic decision making can be distilled to an if-else statement. This is, if this statement is true, do this, otherwise do that. So like, if the person's age is above 24 years old and below 30 years old, match it with person A, otherwise match it with person B. Everything, yeah, this is uh, in like plain English, right? Which means that within all the decision making, we are reducing all the variety of human behavior, all the nuance into binary states, into ones and to zeros. The only way to make automatic processes respond to our signals is to distill it down to machine language, right? something that can be understood by an automatic process. Cutoff points. If it's above, if it's above 24, do this. If it's below, do this. Uh, yes. This is the most famous, I think, at this point, perhaps after page rank. This is edge rank that sorts and uh, governs what you see in your Facebook feeds. I don't think anybody is on Facebook anymore. Nevertheless, and this is an outdated slide because at this point it looks kind of understandable. The rank is like affinity, the score between the viewing user, edge creator, times the weight, times decay. This is from 2013. These days, Facebook's algorithms that govern what you see in the Instagram feed and in Facebook takes into account more than 100,000 signals. Right? 100,000 different variants of your behavior gets put into a ranking algorithm that determines, okay, this content first, this content first, this content first. The objective, of course, is to sell your attention. That's uh, obvious. Keep your attention, sell it. Right? Yeah, or in Mark Zuckerberg's words. That when you give everyone a voice and give people power, the system usually ends up in a really good place. Yeah. I think we should do it one more time. That when you give everyone a voice and give people power, the system usually ends up in a really good place. Yes, I, yeah, absolutely, Mark, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is the Tinder algorithm, right, like it takes into account attractiveness. However do you measure that is a very good question. Activeness and pickiness, right? So that's like the magical variables of the Tinder algorithm. No one really knows how it works. Also, Tinder algorithm, one should be quite uh, suspicious about its incentives. Because when Tinder makes a successful match that leads to a long-term relationship, Tinder loses customers. Right? This is the conundrum of dating apps. Like You do not want to make successful matches. You want to make matches that lead to short-term relationships. Because otherwise you're losing your $250 million, uh, 250 million user, user base. Right? Similarly, this is pointed out by Vinya Gaupta, which is like a self-proclaimed entrepreneur, visionary, crypto evangelist, that currently at this moment, in current future generations, around 10% of kids born this year will have been the result of the Tinder algorithm. So people in Silicon Valley are engineering the future generations. Which is kind of crazy to think about. So, like, that's an algorithm. This is an image of a neural network, the more fancy version of an algorithm, machine learning. Uh, input layer, hidden layer, hidden layer, output layer. Basically, summarized here, a machine learning algorithm is brute forcing solutions to reach a goal. I think that's the best summary. This is a, the vision of a computer vision algorithm, to be able to detect faces in images. Right? So you test, and you test, and you test, and you verify with test data. The critical point of any machine learning algorithm is the data set, like what you train the algorithm on. This is a screenshot from ImageNet, which is the most used and most widely available image database data set. 14 million images that have all been hand annotated. So people have been attributing, describing labels to every image, 14 million unique images. And one wonder, how does one do that? So uh, one does it with low-paid mechanical Turks. Right? So this is a service from Amazon where they offer for any task that a computer cannot do by itself, you can outsource it to Amazon Mechanical Turk, which is a 24-7 global on-demand workforce. 
So basically, low-paid workers spread around the world that gets paid per click. Right? And you, they call it the tasks you automate. is called HIT, or Human Intelligence Task. Similarly, we're also all working for Google and Facebook continuously as we solve these CAPTCHAs, right? Because this is feeding the machine learning algorithms, labels, and data, which has been going on for a long time, which started as a really wonderful, very utopian idea, the reCAPTCHA, which used CAPTCHAs to transcribe books that then later got sold to Google and then co-opted. So now we're all working for free for Google. It described in uh, Surveillance Capitalism by Susanna Zuboff, it's vast data sets, vast data sets predicting human behavior. This is a classic screenshot from Florian Kramer's text on crepularity hermeneutics, which discusses uh, inherent biases in algorithms. I think we're mostly familiar with this, but this is a good example, and it's from 2016, I believe, or 15. Sexism, racism, and other forms of discrimination are being built into the machine learning algorithms that underlie the technology behind many intelligent systems that shape how we are categorized and advertised too. Take a small example from last year. Users discovered that Google's photo app, which applies automatic labels to pictures in digital photo albums, was classifying images of black people as gorillas. Google apologized it was unintentional. Similar errors have emerged in Nikon's camera software, which misread images of Asian people as blinking, and in HP web camera software, which had difficulty recognizing people with dark skin tones. Biases and discrimination are only the extreme cases that extreme cases that make this mechanism most clearly visible. Which is, uh, it, it makes sense, right? Like, but it's also good to know that even if there's no extreme examples, this bias exists continuously all the time. Right? So then the question is, one, one should ask oneself is, what's the agenda, what's the objective, and what's the goal? This is a piece by Trevor Paglin and Kate Crawford where they took ImageNet, the database, and then allowed you to upload an image of yourself to see what the AI would see, what would categorize you as. And then that reveals the bias that if you have a slightly darker skin tone, you're much more likely to get labels such as thief, thug, gangster, whereas if you're then Caucasian like me, you get, uh, it says, I mean, in this case, it's only a person, individual, someone, somebody, mortal, soul, face. Okay, a little break. <laughs> Talking about robots in the previous uh, conversation, this is uh, one of my favorite devices ever. It's such a good found object. It's an automatic step counter. It walks for you. You put your phone in it, and then it just counts the steps. Right? It's such an amazing tool. Yeah, the background story is really dystopic, horrific. It's uh, in China where your health insurance is paired to how many steps you walk every day. So to get a lower premium, you need to walk more. To pay less for health insurance, you have to walk more. So then people just connect their phone to trick the algorithm to suggest that you're walking all the time. Yeah, good and bad. Okay, so we're at my works. I will show three works, uh, all touching on different aspects of this brief introduction. And we're 11 minutes into the presentation, so this is perfect. Yeah. So Talk to Me was a piece from, started in 2017, which was a, uh, presented like this initially in the first exhibition. It was a conversational chatbot, like an online friend. A chatbot that had been trained on all my previous conversations. So I downloaded, I made a data set of everything I said in instant messages from Skype, WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, Instagram, etc. Trained a complicated sequence-to-sequence -sequence neural network on this data to make an autonomous, automatic version of myself. I also created a um, text-to-speech, a voice of myself, right? by recording over a thousand sentences uh, trained to be able to create a synthetic voice. Every time you interacted with this chatbot, you got answers spoken by my voice. 
So in, in a way, it's like uh, completely outsourced so I can have a conversation with myself and the artist will forever be present. This is how it was presented uh, in the first couple of year and a half when it was exhibited. It, um, uh, how many are familiar with this image, roughly? A couple, okay. Classic, uh, this, this little device was constructed in 1770 by Wolfgang von Kempelen to impress Empress Maria Therese of Austria. It's uh, called the first original mechanical Turk. It's a chess machine, right? presented as an autom autonoma that can play chess, while in actuality, this little box there a uh, human hides and pulls levers to play chess. So it's a machine that pretends to be... Uh, it's a machine that pretends to be a machine while actually being controlled by a human. Uh, here, here's a question. How to start an AI startup? Step one, hire a bunch of minimum wage humans to pretend to be AI, pretending to be human, wait for AI to be invented. Classic, classic. So I, I'm not sure if you can guess what this leads to, but the talk to me piece, there was no AI in this piece. Right? A, all that happened was anytime anyone talked, I got a message on my phone and then I answered by myself. <laughs> so I, I pretend to be an AI, pretending to be human, pretending to be AI in a sort of competing idea of Turing testing dystopia. I, I don't know, very strange conversations. And also deeply labor intensive. One would imagine that outsourcing to the machine is great, right? Because, you know, like the machine does everything. But this was, this was much worse, yes. And it lasted for two years, and there was a lot of messages. And I think, in a way, the real story is that I programmed the bot. The bot was very depressing and very, very annoying. And then I figured, in the end, it's far more interesting for me to pretend to be the AI and then people who talk to me will test me nonstop to see is this AI smart or not. People get very impressed because the AI is amazingly smart. It understands everything. <laughs> and then you have like a weird, very strange conversations appear. So it, it gives rise, like the classic first chatbot was in the 60s, uh, presented as a therapist, right? the ELISA, where people were really amazed about the quality which gives rise to the ELISA effect, which we're all like feeling every day. Is the susceptibility of people to read far more understanding than is warranted into strings of symbols, especially words strung together by computers. As long as you have a computer generating it, you'll be like, wow, this makes a lot of sense. In the end, the piece was turned into a book project and then ended. And in the, it's 36 volumes with 740 pages each for a total of one and a half million messages over a course of two years. Which leads me to Friendly Advice, which was the precursor to the Commission for the Impact Festival's Modern Love, right? uh, which happened earlier this year, and it was a commission for Mozilla Foundation within the framework of responsible AI. And Friendly Advice was an online performative artwork by me, in which I invited anyone to book my time for whatever purpose they chose, through the format of a video chat. The artist will be your life coach, remote friend, hang out with you while you cook, watch you browse social media, the last person missing for your group game, assist you with your conceptual art problems, help you decide what to eat, remote watch your kids, solve your programming problems, play a song, or do absolutely nothing with you. Modeled after um, Japanese Friends for Hire services, which are becoming increasingly more popular, that people are offering their time, you can hire a friend to hang out with you or do nothing with you for around like a hundred bucks an hour, depending on. While the meetings were going on, I was coached by a range of performance enhancing algorithms. My speech was moderated, my, I was given advice on what to say or how to act in order to uh, optimize my own behavior, let's say to nudge me to be my best self, to find like the most efficient way, the most productive way of having a conversation. So in this case, you can see there's a bunch of different, the screenshot quality is very low because it's from a video somewhere. There's a couple of different algorithms, which is like intensity, productivity, uh, 
uh, no, intensity, productivity, attention, the current emotion, the current sentiment of what I'm saying, how many words I'm saying, and all the different emotions. Also, uh, on average, it tells me if I'm talking too much or talking too little. It also detects political topics and sort of <laughs> makes everything average, right? Like that's the conclusion of AI, it makes everything average. All the social media platforms optimize for like, uh, optimize away all potential for offensiveness right, in their algorithms. After the meeting, I was given uh, reports on how I was doing uh, based on my performance and I get a grade, all the different stats gets put into order. Here's my emotions over our meeting, the words per minute, the speech sentiment, the emotions, attention, productivity, intensity, and the keyword triggers. Overall, it's a, it was a way to be also to, one, open up this type of, uh, to, to <laughs> I don't know how to say it, it's like a du duality, right? When you're talking to someone who's being coached by an AI, you also, it's kind of confrontational for you, how it reflects back on you when someone is somehow augmented by an automatic process. This augmentation in this case, of course, happens uh, because I, I made the system so I know how to game it as well, how to benefit from it. But it was a very nice performance. I had around 30, 35 different one hour meetings over the course of two weeks, which ranged from uh, complete conspiracy uh, QAnon flat earther believers to people who just wanted directions to drop off a UPS package. It, it was kind of nice, yeah. Which uh, segues us to the commission for the Impact Festival's Modern Love. I have a promo video. Oh, I lost the connection. Ah, oh, it's back. Okay. Struggling to meet new people? Then we can help. Introducing One on One Plus One, an automatic algorithm-based software that pairs you up with your new best friend, lover, or partner in crime. All you have to do is provide your name, social media profiles, and email address. One on One Plus One will automatically pair you up with the best match for you, based on publicly available information. And once you find that special someone, One on One Plus One invites the both of you to a video chat, where you can interact with one another and have an enjoyable first meeting. Not just that, our video meetings are watched over by a range of performance-enhancing algorithms that monitor the meeting and suggest things to say, topics to discuss, and simply nudge the both of you to have a productive and wonderful first encounter. So sign up today to take your social life to the next level. One on one plus one. Yeah, uh, sign up today, yes. Since the launch last week, we've had a 2,400% growth. We went from two users to 40 amazing. So uh, one on one plus one, it aims to solve these problems within a VC venture capitalistic sort of framework. Meeting people is hard, dating apps require a lot of work, people are lazy, people are not truthful, people do not know what to say. Uh, which seems to be the pitch, right, that produces the, the piece. Automatic do nothing matchmaking. Uh, it comes out of a couple of different strains of research, but within the framework of this festival on modern love and algorithms, it seemed to me that part of how it was made is I tried to embody the person, one of the persons I dislike the most, which is the Silicon Valley tech bro, well, all that he represents and how he, he or she or they try to use technology to solve the world's problems to disrupt existing structures and don't give any concern at all for what it may lead to. So I also refer to one on one plus one sort of as the dating app from hell because the profile it makes of you, so it makes a profile of you when you sign up, you have no say at all about this profile. Like you have no agency. Everything you've ever left online gets considered. So I was, the other day I was joking about the algorithm finding Arion's business in the late 90s on some weird internet forum. And I think this is sort of accurate. It like looks for everything. So it also makes it terrible because you have no agency. You have no agency at all. And everything you leave online enters into a permanent record that just stays there. And that's the basis for your romantic match. Right? And then once you find that special someone, 
you get invited to a video meeting that also gets quantified. In order for the matching algorithm to understand and learn if the match was successful or not, it needs to quantify the meeting to be able to determine if it led to a successful match or not. That's, that's the point. So when you sign up, you get to pick your slots for availability, and then based on that, it matches you. I have some screenshots from a meeting I did with a friend of mine uh, that reveals a bit about the process of what it's like to participate in this uh, thing. And I forgot to replace the party emoji with a normal neutral emoji, but I think it's okay. So it starts like this, you get a notice from the plus one process. I'm plus one and I'm, I'll be here to help you with your meeting. Here, uh, plus one suggests a question. Ask, an app mysteriously appears on your phone that does something amazing. What does it do? It also tells you if you're talking too much, you're talking more than your partner, your partner is more sad, your partner is more happy than you, what you're saying is very depressing. Okay, it's enough about this topic. Okay, move away. So like this, this ha does not have a good response. It also, anytime you mention certain specific topics, it augments the conversation with recent news items. Here someone mentioned Netflix and it pops up the three top news items about Netflix. Right? Also gives you emojis to keep the mood light. And yes, you guessed it, right? It, it moderates speech. It tries to keep it happy. Let's not talk about the pandemic. Let's not talk about Trump. Let's not talk about fake news. Let's not talk about COVID-19. Let's not talk about hyperinflation. This is not like love-making conversation, right? It's like the opposite. It puts everything into a database, everything that's said, all the emotions in different numbers, right? and then distills uh, great, like rates. Right? calculates if it was a happy or a sad meeting and turns that into reports. And I'm on 24 minutes, so I have one more minute to summarize, I think. Uh, in a way, it's like, the, I think the, the sort of the goal with the piece is both to be a bit confronting with uh, a sort of prediction for the future of where the dating apps will be in a year or two where they have worked out some even more performative algorithm. Although from most research, it shows that the dating apps algorithms aren't very good at creating matches. Whether that's intentional or not, it's something else. Right? Primarily because people are not really truthful about themselves and how you present yourself. You might think you're funny, but that doesn't guarantee that other people think you're funny. Uh, and then it predicts it, it predicts it, it also confronts you with the sensation of being quantified. What does it feel like to be coached by an automatic process? Someone who sits on your shoulder and gives you tips, like, okay, why don't you do this, why don't you do that? If anyone remembers, I think it was 2004, uh, John Kerry versus George W. Bush uh, debates, where Bush was accused of having been real-time coached, because he had a block, like a square, on his suit, and someone thought that he had a team of people giving him advice on what to say. It's a bit like this, right? You're getting coached. But then it's also everything you say and everything you express gets put into a data set that gets sort of used to sell you products or not. And I think with that, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Jonas. Yes, um, I think... Well, I get the corner. You get the corner office. Nice. nice. Wow. It means he's a nice girl. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry. Um, Roana, does this ring a bell with any of the apps of the future that you have found in your research? Yeah, so many. So many bells, Jonas. Mm. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I was, I was laughing, actually, because on the last thing you said with the coach um, mm. that exists in similar ways, right, in, in some of the, the apps that are in a, in a different way. Mm. But one of the apps that I tried, um, it wouldn't give me coaching, but it, but it gave you advice on how to the date went. Mm -hmm. And then you had a kind of automatic aftercare with a algorithm. And the problem was it did more. So... Um, it would read your face mm. to see uh, how you responded to a meeting and then if you have a resting bitch face or if you have a baby that doesn't really sleep well and you look like 
I do most of the time nowadays, then it will say after every meeting, like, nope, not mm -hmm. a good match, you yeah. know, not a good match. Um, so they are, they are trying to get there, but yeah, I, I write in my book and I often say during my talks, dating apps, they run on hope, and the last thing they want is indeed that you're going to be an off customer. So I agree with Jonas there, that um, mm. they want you to stay there. Yeah, so basically they're also wanting you to fail, in a sense. It, unless they have a different business model. So there are now apps. I recently talked to uh, founders of another dating app idea. And so most of the dating apps, they either get their money because yeah. you go to an upgrade, where suddenly mm. you find more better looking matches, mm. or because they sell your data, because you're just spending a lot of time and so you, know, you see more advertisements, etc. So that's an indirect way of earning money. There are now dating apps already running that have a different business model, namely they get paid once you go on a date. Mm. So what they do is they have a, they work with the same, like you, you choose a, a, so it's like a, a data pl planner, a date yeah. planner, yeah. Um, and then they work with restaurants and they get a little bit of money from the restaurant if they send you there. Uh, yes. And also they, they get paid once you're both there and you have to check in and then mm -hmm. they get paid. So they're a bit more careful in what they promise you. They promise you a fun evening, not so much the love of your life. But, you know, we can say all skeptical things about that, but the good thing is you go quite quickly on a date. And I think that's the number one way to find out whether you're a match, and it's much easier to know for some reason than when you're chatting with each other, because your intuition is just not giving you all the signals. Mm. But yeah, much in the making. Jonas, you said, uh, please, let's not end with, capitalism is bad. Yeah. So I'm going to start with that. Uh, <laughs> nice, yeah. very good. <laughs> what, what, is, what is the consequence of our um, love searching activities and our love life or even just our flirt life or our sex life being so fully capi capitalized as it is? And, you know, if, if going to a restaurant is being, um, you know, capitalized and everything is being monetized and mm. there's incentives for, for all the different partners to make money out of you know, our dating life. What, what, what does that do? Or doesn't it, doesn't it matter? It's a good question. Just before, I just want to respond very briefly to mm. this. I know Japan invested something like one billion dollars in promoting love because their birth rate is super low. So the population yeah. is cons they evil, live with dolls. predicted to decrease by something like 30 million people by 2050. So they're investing a lot in, in uh, offering people to build new dating apps to promote love. Right? So it, also in one-on-one -on -one plus one, because everything gets quantified, if you mention, for example, oh, I'm so thirsty, you can just get ads for drinks and the talks can be sponsored. So it's like a very good monetization, part of the sales pitch. Right? Uh, what happens with capitalists, everything gets monetized, commodified. I don't know what happens. I don't know if it's very different from any other aspect of uh, mm. like daily life today where basically everything gets in infected, let's say, by a market, by a commodification, by, uh, like, uh, by let's, the C word that we don't mention. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what happens. I, I guess it's not a good thing in the end, right? Mm. Like if you if you get the sensation of what it feels like to be in like a marketplace of being quantified, of everything you do gets put into a predictive model on what the future you will do, we already know kind of what that leads like in sort of politics, which mm -hmm. is not very good, right? It's just more separation, more binary thinking, more conflict, more everything, more misinformation, more crisis, more every, like bad news, right? So then if that also then infects, let's say, the Silicon Valley ideology infects also uh, relationship building. Uh, I mean, if this app was a legit app that really tried to compete with Match Group, Match Group is the owner of Tinder, Hinge, OkCupid, Match.com. They own like 65%, 70% of the market. Uh, Tinder itself is valued at $45 billion. 
Like it's an enormous market, so that's why. Uh, if that infects it, it's, yeah, I don't know, it's like it's probably not a good thing, I wouldn't, wouldn't imagine. No, but, but maybe it's see, even... Now we're ending there again. No, like no, because we're not, uh, and we're not at the end. Oh, yeah, okay, so. good. But yeah, I we like, can rescue it. So. I like what you say, that it's yeah. not just uh, capitalism, but quantification, which could is more general... Yeah, yeah. Uh, and could I, could yeah. I add two things yeah. to that? Because I think, firstly, I think we tend to now really see this... this um, linked to technology. Mm -hmm. But I think if you look back in the history of dating, it's also interesting to think about there has been a time where dating was happening inside the house under the close suspicion mm -hmm. of your parents, mm -hmm. right? And then at some point we got a new industry, movie theaters, mm -hmm. bars, cafes, and you were allowed to go there with a male and a female, most obviously. And this gave a lot of freedom to people, but it also meant that you had a super unexpected, almost, peak in what people started to spend. Mm. Lipstick, you know, because you had to look pretty. Uh, car fuel, because you wanted to go to the driving uh, cinema. If you were a guy, you were expected to do something cool, so it became more important to earn a lot of money while before you could at least go to the parents' house and that was it. You would sit there awkwardly with your coffee trying to make an impression on the parents. So it has good and bad sides. And I think um, that, that kind of going outside and, and dating in the public space. And I think perhaps one other thing to keep an eye on is that this whole technique has an aura of neutrality to us. It seems like the algorithm knows, and it is very easy or tempting, especially if they get more developed and if they get PR'd in a good way, to think that the algorithm indeed perhaps mm -hmm. might know more. And, you know, many people say, we don't really know what we know in love, and so perhaps the algorithm knows it better. But if I was talking to a lot of computer programmers and startup guys coming up with new dating, dating apps, I was shocked by the simplicity of what was put into the algorithm. So they would say like, oh, we just came up with some factors, like we read five articles and then we said, uh, we'll look at age, hobbies, how you respond to a former date, music taste, and, and those were the seven factors, but it came across as super mm. well-developed and really well-matched. And so I think the real risk is perhaps not only in who are these people making money, but also in us underestimating our own intuition and starting to lean more on what we think is a wise kind of computer. And that, I think, would be a scary future scenario if we start doing that. I have a question here that I think maybe fits in with this well. Um, it is from the online audience, uh, someone, uh, Pim. If algorithms get better and better in machine learning and they learn from us and we serve them only behavior and messages that are more or less negative, non-emphatic, unhappy, non-romantic, and or bad stuff, well, that would seem bad stuff, will that not lead to even further dehuman dehumanizing the human beings in the future? Or it could even accelerate on this. What is your response? Yes. Or, or maybe is it's the, 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 the <laughs> Uh, yeah. other side of that would be, are we all obliged to only type in happy messages so that in the future we will all be very happy? Mm. I mean, it's, it's clear from, like, if you look at the Facebook algorithm, for example, that the strongest emotional trigger is fear and anger. So, it, uh, like, it optimizes for that above anything else. Like, because it produces the best engagement, it increases the time you spend in the platform, it, more attention means more money to advertisements, etc. So that like manipulation with our emotion is already there, right? Like our emotion is just raw data for up for sale, basically. To counter that's very difficult to find in yourself to not uh, instantly go for the fear or anger response. I think next to impossible. So I don't know, probably you would have to have some really like clever, ethically sound people with good agendas or objectives behind these systems for it to change. This is certainly not the current state of the world, mm. you know, like where most of it is just about, uh, it's just a market, right? Like uh, manipulating people's psychology and behavior for profit, 
we're classic capitalism, mm, right? Mm. Market. Human emotion is up for sale, right? I don't know, like... How do we counter that? I yes, mean, uh, like you, you mentioned agency, Rani, yeah. you mentioned uh, intuition. I mean, how can we... Can we uh, well, I mean, uh, I haven't read the book yet, but uh, yeah. I heard that, uh, what's his name, Mo from Google, I uh, just brought out a book, and I think one of his arguments in the book is indeed, and I, I wasn't so sure about it, but I thought it was a nice, kind of friendly idea at least. He said we should watch out. He saw a trend amongst people that got, that got so overwhelmed and terrified with conspiracy <laughs> thinkers or really a lot of negativity that they kind of pull out of the whole system and they start no longer responding and he said that's a dangerous thing especially for what you for what Pete is sketching so instead we should engage in the thoughtful conversation so that the algorithms is are also taking up that I think what you see in social media for that perhaps it's more clear where to not go I mean mm -hmm. for now I just said in my talk it's probably one of the biggest social experiments where we were all kind of trapped into something and then 10 years later we look up and oh my god my focus has gone uh, and my children have filter anxiety you know where girls especially um, are ashamed of how they look because they're so used to seeing Without filtered filter. skins mm -hmm. yeah mm. and you see that increasing and so now there's a lot of talk on how could you have social media and that's actually actually social and I think one of the clear things Clubhouse didn't really work but the perhaps the good idea there was to if you have very short kind of responses where people can just type away and if there is no moderator to kind of stop me when I rant um, for sure we know that that offers a Twitter as it is now right mm -hmm. where people really get really much more harsh much more aggressive much more mean and you see the same mm -hmm. below newspaper articles, for example, where it seems like only the angry people have mm. the energy to respond and all the neutral people just think, oh, nice article. Mm. Um, so, I, so I think there's something there with, with actual conversations, um, perhaps also with no anonymity, uh, anonymity mm. although that also has a downside because there's mm. so many people who now, from especially from war countries or other areas that are able to speak up because it's anonymous. So I don't know the answer, but mm. I do try to try to be realistic, and that means look within um, what we have, but see whether we can optimize it for the better. Actually, I, I remember now. It took me a while to just find mm. this thought. It's it's clear actually. Like the broken dominant business model of the internet is advertising. You just have to mm. under you just have to destroy the advertising industry. That's it. Because then, like that, optimizes for oh. completely <laughs> wrong engagements, right? So you yeah. you build, you have to you have to ask our nice politicians to regulate down Facebook and Google. That's it. Like yeah. you just break it and then provide different types of monetization models, and it's solved, right? Because then you don't have to optimize for engagement and fear. Yeah. So that's it. That's just like yeah, easy. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, good point uh, for going to the audience to see if there are questions there, and we can start throwing the mic. Yes, I see someone here on the left side. Question. Whoops. <laughs> uh, yeah, Jonas, I would like to ask you about uh, the piece um, that you showed first, with uh, where you were on constantly with your phone, you had to respond to the people. Ah, yeah, yeah, talk to me. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and I thought it was curious uh, uh, just um, that you actually, the way I understood it, you didn't, you could have, uh, you could have potentially like answered the phone, right? You could have, instead of using uh, a, a robotized version of your own voice. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But, and I thought it was curious because you talked about Eliza effect and doesn't the Eliza effect then depend a little bit on the fact that because if you would have done that, no one would have believed it, right? Mm, and the yeah. fact that you were actually somehow automatized made it believable. So the Lysa effect depends also on that something is not really working there, right? Like perfectly. I mean, I mean, it depends on you thinking that you're interacting with a computer and then ascribing more meaning to it because it is a computer. It's like the magic technology, right? So like mm -hmm. you just get... Uh, you get tricked by the machine. Maybe you experience something similar with your friend in some cases, like the, f the autom automated friend. 
friendship apps, right? You mean that there was actually a girl like, behind there? Like, no, I mean, that's also very likely, <laughs> yeah. I would say, because many of those automated, automated chatbot services are just low-paid workers that just do it. Like, so many of bots you interact with are actually people. Like, uh, uh, the majority, I would say, at this point. So it's a way of, it's, the, that's more the, the line of research, I think, to explore what it's like if you're interacting with a bot, but actually you think you're interacting with a bot, and that's your default, so you test it, but actually the bot is not a bot, but pretending to be a bot. And then you have like this convoluted exchange of like, how do you distill like the core meaning in this interaction? It's like, but did you ever consider being there on the phone instead? I mean, it was not uh, phone, it was only via text message. I know, that's what yeah. I mean, but did yeah. you ever consider to do it just, you could have been, you could have, instead of spending all that time recording all those messages, uh, yeah, sure, you could sure. have sat there just yeah. taking the phone all the time. I mean, yeah, but it's, it, it's even more distracting, I think. It's like, personally, I really dislike talking on the phone, especially with strangers. Like, if there's someone I like, it's fine, but with strangers, no. This, so, is, this uh, is also very typical for our generation, right? Yes, and it goes more like, below. Uh, we don't like calling, we yeah. like apping more. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But you think it would have, I, I'm just curious because I think yeah. it wouldn't have worked, and I think it, people would yeah, have Yeah, for believed. sure, yeah, yeah, for sure. You would have to have a synthesized actual voice, yeah, like a yeah. vocoder or something, yeah. to sound like a computer and just be like, hello. Or you synthesize the Siri voice, or whatever, something like this. Yeah. But yeah, for sure, it's different, absolutely. Yeah. Any other questions? So then I, I have a I question. one question yeah. to Jonas oh, yes, as well, because in one of your slides you could see the emotions between you and your partner, yeah. and there was one really peak <laughs> yeah. trigger word or something. What was mm. that? I have no yeah. idea. I don't remember, honestly. But I think um, there was, in the first friendly advice section, there was a lot of different trigger words. And a core part of them was like international art English words, like the <laughs> offenders of like this position or the contemporaneity or stuff mm -hmm. like that. So every time you mention like an international art English word, you get a warning and be like, hey, come on, like, <laughs> don't speak <laughs> like this, you know? And then I think probably it was that, I would say. Oh. Yeah, that's like the art world trigger. Um, yeah. There's uh, still the, the, qu the question that was actually popping up in uh, the first half of this double bill, but I can ask it to uh, both of you. Mm. It's from uh, Lotte. Um, and she writes, how do you see friendship with AI or maybe also in the dating environment uh, and being one-sided? Because isn't friendship or a sexual relationship also about supporting or pleasuring the other? So I take this as meaning um, in these friendships or relationships, everything is about me. How can we also make it about the other uh, being a bot or an avatar friend or a robot, would that be possible? I'm kind of modifying the question now, but. I, I think Iran had covered this very well in the sex doll episode in the talk. It's like the, if the AI's automatic processes naturally will just be supportive of you, they will never try and criticize you, right? <laughs> in some sense, in a relationship, which is really only half a relationship in that case. Like it's not a replacement. Mm. And it indeed just brings... Who was that? It was some talk yesterday or the other day talking about the future narcissism. Like everybody in the future is like a complete narcissist. Right? I guess that's what it leads to in a way. So then yeah. if it... I don't know if you think of it as a real friendship. But surely I know people who are like... Uh, who spend many hours investing time in their like World of Warcraft character. You know? mm -hmm. And then become like absolutely like losing a loved one when somehow it breaks something goes wrong because it's like thousands of hours invested in this like digital avatar and that's a equally important like that's kind of a love relationship in a way although it might be kind of one-sided but still it's there so I don't know like yeah I, I write about both those things so also people who fall in love as avatar on another avatar so not the human but the avatar with the avatar um, <laughs> and I write I, I searched back into philosophy, like what does friendship really mean? Mm. And I think on the basis of the, the definitions from philosophy, you can't say that a one-sided feeling for a computer um, is a friendship, because oftentimes it is about giving back and forth mm -hmm. and also experiencing with two souls something. But you could perhaps say that, you know, there is something sometimes 
with finding distraction or finding fun and amusement. And I wouldn't call that friendship or even finding coaching, because some of these AIs become pretty good at like first selected coaching. I think still there's a danger there, so I don't think it's a good way to go there. Um, but I do see that for some people it might be a little bit. What, what I found terrifying, it's not in my book, um, but I saw a startup that had for people with dementia, it would take your voice mm. and it would be able to, when your mom keeps calling you, and always ask the same question, and you will always repeat the same answer because you know it's going to calm her down, it will do that for you. And this actually already exists. And I realized this, and when I use it during lectures, some of the people go, well, that's kind of nice because, you know, my mom calls me all the time, and I'm not always there to pick up because I have a job, and then sometimes she panics, so what's the problem? with having a butt on the other hand and saying calming things like, oh, mom, do you remember the old holidays? How's the weather at your side? You know, just in your voice. Mm. Well, what is the problem? Well, if you consider for, well, one, <laughs> one is very technical, like, you know, um, what if the bot says something really weird, which happens all the time, because it, y there is a moment where you, you realize, like, oh, this is odd. Um, or the technique fails, and you can, you can imagine the panicking happening, especially if somebody is not clear-headed. But another thing that I could see happening is, if it's actually working really well, it becomes so much easier to not go, to not visit anymore, because you think, well, she's calling me every, time, every day, ten times, and she hears me, right? Yeah. So what's the thing? And I do think that perhaps as an add-on, some things might be helpful, but I think the, the fearful part is, or the, the scary part is, if we consider it as takeovers, then we lose the things that get lost in non-human connection. Yeah, and I really like, uh, we were uh, talking beforehand um, about this notion of crapularity that is in uh, the essay by Florian Kramer. Um, well, maybe you can uh, explain what crapularity entails. I think you're probably better at okay. explaining. Well, obviously, <laughs> it's a pun answer. on singularity, which is the point where computer intelligence uh, uh, goes beyond human intelligence, uh, which is all that everyone's talking about in Silicon Valley. And um, he talks about crapularity, which is also um, really about how we as humans mm. kind of dumb down to... Uh, the level of technology w and not the technology coming up towards uh, our intelligent level, which basically means, I think it's something that, that we've seen in both your presentations, mm. because you mentioned, you know, in the end everything becomes average and boring, and mm. that's also kind of what you said, you know, everything will be boring and uh, uh, confirming of, of what is already there. Or I think you give a good example, I think in your own book, uh, Frixi, <laughs> That, that Google nowadays finishes your sentences for you, right? Mm -hmm. Which can be really handy. But the weird thing is that it uses phrases that you would probably not use. For me, it does. Like, it mm. says awesome all the time. I never say awesome. But then sometimes <laughs> I click enter because it's just easy. Yeah. Which feeds the algorithm with more awesomeness until we all constantly say awesome. Well, you're, I'm, I'm making this up. Yeah, now. no, it's, it's directly like yeah. that in your book. But that's, so it's, it's, it's going to be a unifying kind of yeah. language as well. It's the same on LinkedIn, and on LinkedIn they always uh, propose to me to say kudos. Really? <laughs> Where did they get that? Wow. And I also think, uh, you know, everyone using all these exclamation marks uh, and so on, oh, and I, I really do that as well, and I have to delete them, you know. I have to, it, it actually brings me more work instead of less, because, you know, I, I immediately have all these exclamation marks and I don't want them because then you are so super excited and happy. You know what's funny, when I, when I ask my students, for example, at the I teach at the university, and when I ask them, how many of you have walked up to a stranger in the past year and asked about for a date? There will be like one or two in a class. Mm. And if I ask them, how many of you were sent by an algorithm to meet with a stranger? All mm. of them, right? And many of them find 
old-fashioned, like making an impression in a bar and walking up to a stranger, really old-fashioned. They say, "What if the person is married? I'm not going to do that." You know, and they all start smiling. And they're probably right. Like it's、yeah. easier because even if you get rejected, there's still a screen. There's、mm. still it's still less horrible than where you're standing there and you're giving it a go, and a person says. Sorry, you're really just not my type. You know that's pain. It is scary, I must say. I'm looking one more time in the audience because there's, I, no, yes, there's a question there in the back. Far catch. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Woo.、So、yeah. <coughs> like,、um, I would like your opinions on it. Like,、uh, with your examples, like the one on one plus one, where you kind of like. Try to make everything neutral, and in the like say the sex dolls, where it's kind of like it always it's very efficient. It gives you only the things you ask for.、Um, couldn't you use like those same mechanisms, let's say, to like co-opt it and flip it around and say, let's say, you make like uncomfortable algorithms that kind of like kind of like a coach that would dare you to say maybe be a bit more yourself or like talk a bit more、mm. about outrageous. Things to see how the other person reacts, or like a sex doll that's once in a while <laughs> does something a bit uncomfortable to see how far it can get with it, and if you like it, maybe. Like, I, yeah, what are your thoughts on like those kind of like、uh, ways to approach it? I think you should、uh, sign up for one on one plus one because it's <laughs> no, but more because it's、uh, part of the performance you undergo. There's like the voice of the AI. And the voice of the AI have a pretty like a de depressing point of view. He complains, he, she, it, they complain a lot about you, about its work, about the labor, about all of it, just to also provoke a sensation of like an entity that exists, right? To make it not the blandness, like everything becomes like a average. So in, in a way, it's for sure it's an opportunity to inject sort of criticism or. Different points of view within that performance, for sure, and then that、uh, then can confront you with reflecting upon that more and more. I think.、Yeah. How、so、do we sign up?、Uh, one on one, one on one dot plus. Yeah, sign up. <laughs> <laughs> That's it.、Uh, it will help me sell it to an investment fund later on, and you will. Any every participant will get a percentage. I promise. <laughs> well, that that sounds like a true capitalist incentive. Yes. So yes. go there and sign up. Yes. We have to close off. So after you've signed up for one on one dot plus, uh, also uh, sign up to get a notification about Rowan's book, which is out early next year. Yeah, January. And. That、you can scan a QR code in the bookshop. I think here. Ah,、mm. scan the QR code. We are、uh, all well, very familiar with QR codes、uh, by now, so that shouldn't be a problem. I also want to、uh, really welcome you to the other events and、uh, panels that are on the program. I was told they would be、uh, on the slide, but well, maybe they will、uh, come up right now. Uh, yes, at three o'clock you can see the screening program, the new joy of sex and impact TV, AI romance and Freudian labyrinths in Studio Three. Sounds、uh, fascinating, so stay around.、Uh, very much. Thank you for your、uh, questions, attention, and、um, intimacy. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>